thanks everybody for being here. I know I'm standing between you and icy cold refreshments. So I'll, uh, I'll try and keep, uh, keep on point. This is a, a project though, that, uh, um, you know, as a, as a scientist and, and somebody interested in um, genetic improvement has been a really a fun project. And it's been the result actually of a conversation um, that occurred at uh, the BIF meetings in South Dakota. So a couple of years ago, um, uh, Mark Anderson and Joe Epperly are in the back with, with two of them and uh, representatives from uh, Wolf Cattle and uh, their associated dairy enterprises. And I think Bruce Golden and Matt and um, myself and a number of others were in the room a meeting called together by Jerry Wolf. And uh, Jerry said, we've been collecting this data. Um, we'd like to figure out a way to use it um, to inform um, genetic selection decisions in our operation, both the seed stock level and certainly in um, their dairy business. And so um, that set out what, uh, Epperly, if I remember right, we're like, yeah, this is no problem. This would be great. A few months. Well, as usual, I grossly underestimated um, the potential uh, um, time it might take. Um, uh, and I think we all underestimated the complexity of the data. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I think this is a great example of um, commercial data flowing back into um, seed stock organizations and genetic evaluation programs um, that has the opportunity, uh, I shouldn't say has the opportunity, it's already being really impactful um, in breeding decisions um, in, uh, in limousine and, and certainly some other breeds, but certainly at um, the commercial level as this uh, uh, beef on dairy uh, enterprise um, has taken off. And I think uh, I wanted to start off with, we had you know, some good discussion at the NAAB meeting uh, on Tuesday night about beef on dairy. And um, uh, I don't think it's an understatement to call it a disruptor. Uh, I see Don Trimmer, Don, thanks for being here. Um, the, the beef on dairy uh, insemination or semen business, um, you know, has a, the, the growth has been phenomenal. Um, and really driven, I think, by both advanced reproductive technology, so gender sort semen, more effective estrus synchronization and AI um, in the dairy sector, has freed up breeding slots, basically, for terminal beef bulls to be used um, in the dairy system. And so, um, you know, the, the dairy, commercial dairy industry is a great example. We had uh, a couple of talks at the BIF meeting in Georgia about the uptake of genomics in the dairy sector. Um, that trend obviously has continued um, at a blistering pace. And so, you know, many commercial dairy operations use genomic tools to breed and select replacement females. Um, certainly, um, um, AI companies have, have revolutionized the way that they go about building and selecting um, uh, dairy bulls to go into their lineup. Um, and that combined with the repro technologies um, has really focused their selection at the, um, at the dairy to build these really high merit replacement females um, into their systems. Um, and again, freed up breeding slots for beef semen to be used on dairy cows. Those dairy cows tend to be ones that are um, often older in age. So, um, um, uh, multi-parity kind of cows that are harder to settle. Um, they may have you know, other uh, metabolic issues or, or things that preclude them from being easy conceptors. Um, and in many cases, we could typify those as cows that um, you're lower producing or genetic merit that they don't wanna propagate into their dairy replacement system. Um, but obviously in the dairy system, no calf, no milk. And so um, they continue to try and breed those females and then build um, a value added calf product, right? So if we think about um, you know, the dairy supply or the supply of dairy calves into the beef value chain, um, a substantial number of animals, um, this has turned out to be a, a really dramatic opportunity to uh, increase the value and marketability of those calves, which ultimately um, at a dairy operation, and I, I should point out, uh, Jerry Wolf gave a really nice talk on our NBCEC brown bagger um, last fall that has a lot more background data on um, their particular beef builder project and the breeding to feeding uh, activities that they've got underway. Um, and so I'd point you to that if, if you're really interested in, in some of the nuts and bolts details. We'll talk about a few of them. I stole a few slides out of Jerry's talk, um, but really driven to kind of add value to these calves um, and make them more uh, profitable through uh, the beef chain. 
Um, so participants in the project, I wanted to give, again, uh, I think a really great uh, collaboration of, of people uh, and businesses. So Wolf Cattle, obviously a driver in that. Riverview LLP is the dairy um, partner. Um, uh, North American Limousine Foundation, of course. I should have put, I see Jim Bolter in the back. Jim has been uh, very instrumental in this project. I should have included Digital Beef. Um, they are a service provider to, uh, to NALF. Uh, a lot of interaction with the IGS science team as we wanted to develop, and I'll talk about some goals in the project in just a minute, um, but ultimately we needed to get a home for this data in terms of routine genetic evaluation. Um, and then I put K-State on there. I'm a K-State uh, faculty member, but do some consulting work um, with uh, uh, Limousine and IGS. So um, other thanks, uh, Dr. Spangler just exited the room. Um, Matt and uh, Dr. Bruce Golden were um, great uh, colleagues and, and useful and bouncing a lot of ideas off uh, data analytic strategies um, for this data because um, messy probably doesn't do it justice. Okay, um, it, it, it's, uh, it's a really interesting data set, but driven out of uh, this breeding to feeding program uh, at Wolf. And um, again, I'd point you to that NBC EC um, a presentation that Jerry did. He did a nice job of, of summarizing it. Um, this is a photo of one of their, uh, the Riverview um, headquarters and, and office space and, and buildings. Um, but they've got a sort of a variety of segments in, in Riverview. Um, the beef component of it, um, they feed and slaughter or feed and market uh, about 92,000 head of, um, of beef cattle uh, to the carcass endpoint. Um, about 3,000 uh, breeding cows, um, sell about 650 bulls. Um, the dairy side of the business, as big as the beef side looks, the dairy side's massive. Um, milk about 120,000 cows and about 100,000 heifers in production. Okay, so um, just a, a really massive scaled um, set of enterprises, which you know ultimately provides a really strong motivator for um, them to integrate and integrate data across segments, right? So how can we do a better job adding value to uh, our dairy calf products and our dairy system um, by making uh, strategic uh, uh, selection decisions uh, of those beef bull matings? Um, one of the drivers in this has been uh, initially, you know, beef bulls, uh, aside from, um, you know, producing more valuable beef calves, um, beef bulls actually sell uh, hard to conceive dairy cows better than dairy bulls do. Um, and so one of the, the principal strategies early on in the system, and, and one, um, frankly, that was from a discussion with Jerry, hard to keep up with demand. So they would go and, and progeny test bulls for fertility, the conception rate precisely. Um, but the, the progeny test piece for fertility, um, if you're sitting down, target between 1,000 and 1,250 matings. So it's not like we're gonna breed 100 and see how the bull breeds. We're gonna make 1,000 or 1,250 matings. Well, you know, most dairies, two and a half roughly services per conception. Um, that means about a 40% conception rate. Um, so one of these early young bulls that's just getting fertility tested produces somewhere between four and 500 carcass progeny through the system, okay? How many bulls in any breed evaluation have four or 500 carcass records available for analysis? There, you could count them on two hands probably, okay? Um, before we started capturing this kind of data. Because if you look back in structured sire carcass test programs, and I was involved in structured ones at Gelfi and Simmental, the target was to produce, to get a first read on a bull somewhere around 25 steer progeny per sire. And most of the time when we got that done, it was good enough, right? And, you know, carcass traits are, are relatively moderate to high inheritability. So that does give us a nice read, but it pales in comparison to, you know, bulls that are 0.8 or 0.9 in accuracy and have thousands of carcass progeny, okay? And that's what uh, ends up happening here. Okay, so, um, you know, the dairy system uh, and beef are, are largely um, of that scale, largely centered in sort of Minnesota and South Dakota, um, but operations for uh, additional components of that, uh, uh, certainly in the southern U.S. Uh, in more arid climates. Um, you know, the beef system, again, um, about a 45,000 head feeding capacity, um, about 92,000 of those come through on the beef on dairy side. Um, so a, a pretty substantial flow of cattle in and out on a weekly basis. Uh, again, about uh, 2,500 to 3,000 uh, seed stock cows 
um, on the beef side of the selection system. So, you know, impactful in scale on, on both sides. The objectives of our specific project were to investigate the feasibility and the impact uh, of inclusion of beef on dairy carcass records in national cattle evaluation system. So um, when you step back and start thinking about that, and, and we sort of, as I mentioned earlier, underestimated the complexity of that. Um, you know, we're talking about a, a volume of data that you don't wanna necessarily just drop in an evaluation and turn loose a set of production EPDs the next week, because I promise, Carrie, right, we'll get phone calls. Um, <laughs> And some of them not maybe real happy phone calls. Okay, so we wanted to do our due diligence and make sure that we prototyped um, the evaluation and had a really good idea of the impact um, of including um, that amount of data. So um, on our first sort of exercise, if you think about just the limousine database, about 11,000 carcass records um, uh, in that data set, um, somewhere 70 to 80,000, if I remember right, Mark, ultrasound records. So not an inconsequential amount of data, um, but the first data that we were talking about, including we started with about 40,000 carcass records from the Wolf Riverview program, and after edits, about 27,000 records. So nearly a threefold increase in the drop. Okay, and so it has a huge impact on uh, ability to move around sires in terms of genetic evaluation. So we wanted to make sure we did it right. Um, some of the challenges, if we think about multi-breed genetic evaluations, um, the things that we need to adjust for to make that evaluation happen. Um, if you look into uh, the IGS models, um, they have a set of breed effects or breed solutions that we use to basically put all the animals on a standard breed constant and uh, adjust heterosis out and so forth. So we do an apples to apples comparison. Well, the dairy breed estimate was dairy breed, right? Well, do you suppose is there a substantial difference in the merit of Holstein cows for carcass weight versus Jersey cows? Yeah. Um, so we dug around in the literature and there's some decent amount of literature, particularly from uh, uh, US Mark, um, but it's pretty dated um, and not very many records. So one of the first things we needed to understand was, well, what are the breed effects and what are the contrast between Holstein and Jersey for the carcass traits that we evaluate? So we use this data to, to estimate those. Um, and then also we wanted to think through um, some different model evaluation methods potentially as we thought about, well, what are some of the challenges in terms of, you know, if the heritabilities are really different um, or the genetic correlations are a lot different in the dairy data than the beef data, how do we handle that in terms of evaluation structure, um, potentially by adding correlated trait models and so forth. Fortunately, we didn't have to go down that road. Um, and then lastly, we wanted to have a good understanding of what kind of impact the additional carcass data had um, on EPD reliability. So um, uh, both myself and Mati Sachi at IGS worked um, on a variety of different uh, sort of reliability estimates um, to make sure we kind of understood how impactful this data was. Um, some of the model changes then that uh, came out and when we had uh, production runs of those EPDs um, included uh, updated breed contrast and these kind of fell in line with about the same timing as updated uh, mark breed contrast for the beef breed so that kind of worked out fairly well. Um, some changes in the evaluation structure previously a weaning weight record was required on carcass records as a way to account for culling bias. Um, well, we don't have weaning weights on these calves, right? They go from um, the dam at a couple of days to a uh, calf hutch system, to a calf ranch, uh, to group housing, and eventually to the feed yard. Um, and so we had to make some modifications in, in the data analysis structure to handle those records. Um, so what was the data? Well, about, again, 50,000 um, beef on dairy carcass records. Those included the, the typical suspects in terms of hot carcass weight, ribeye area, fat, marbling, and yield grade. Um, the, the calves were mostly the progeny of either purebred three-quarter or half-blood uh, limousine sires. We had a handful of Angus bulls and, and some other stuff um, um, in there, particularly in some of the older data. Um, and the dairy dams were uh, Holstein, Jersey or Holstein Jersey crosses. Okay. And we had some uh, pedigree data, but most of that pedigree or breed information was coded in um, uh, the data that they get through uh, one of their data service providers on the dairy side. Um, and so we use that to construct um, uh, breed fractions for uh, each individual calf. There are about 1,100 um, uh, 
beef sires uh, represented in the pedigree um, of these animals. Um, there's about 80 or 90 bulls that are actively used in the in the test, but you know a pretty broad sampling of the, the limousine pedigree represented um, through those bulls. Uh, another piece of data we uh, found really useful is the Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding, the organization that does the genetic evaluation servicing for the dairy industry, um, produces um, um, a triannual um, or three times a year genetic evaluation that's published um, and included in that um, is some really useful uh, NAAB code to uh, dairy bull registration number cross-reference. So the dairy data we get through the system, um, the breeding records are based on NAAB cane codes. Um, and so we have to translate cane code to registration number on, on the dairy side to build out uh, the dairy dam pedigrees. And I'll explain why we did that in just a minute. Our initial view was really, we can just tackle this as a sire model and move on. That turns out to not be the case. Um, additional data, of course, that go in those records, uh, kind of the typical stuff on and off uh, feed, uh, slaughter date. Uh, we did get some health information that's part of a future study that we've planned. Um, some pen data um, or pen ID, right? To assign contemporary group slaughter location, um, what parity um, this calf resulted from in, in those cows. And then we calculated days on feed and age of slaughter, primarily as some summary statistics to understand the contemporary grouping. Um, that slide did not come through well, apologies. Um, it looks better up there than here. Um, so the contemporary group then, um, the definition that we sort of settled on was a common plant and kill lot, um, a feedlot ID, um, Lot number and pin number in this case happened to be confounded. Kill date. Um, and uh, we ended up uh, forcing uh, the contemporary group to include um, feedlot arrival date because one of the things that happens in these large volumes of calves, they aggregate calves from multiple dairies at a calf depot um, and then weekly ship calves from that depot to um, the calf ranch and then they come out of the calf ranch and go to the feed yard. Um, well, as those calves move around, they kind of tend to aggregate um, animals into a pen over a period of time. Well, so you can't use just slaughter date from a group of calves that come out of a pen to identify the contemporary group because then, you know, they'll typically in their management system have three kill dates out of a pen, but represents multiple on feed dates. Okay. And so if you don't control both ends of that, you end up with differences in days on feed embedded in the contemporary group. And so um, this data forces both of those so that we've got basically days on feed constant within pen. Um, in an ordinary um, carcass test program, you know, most of the animal breeders in the room would start jumping up and down because we've made a really small contemporary group when we do that. Well, the good news is here, um, these are contemporary groups still of 70 or 80 head um, with, you know, three or four sires represented. So um, they're still really uh, sizable contemporary groups in the grand scheme of things. We could make them much larger, but, um, this seemed to, to be the sort of practical approach for um, controlling those variables, particularly days on feed. So you can see here, um, you know, the, the contemporary groups in this initial date of about 27,000 records there ended up about 924 um, um, contemporary groups. Um, days on feed ranged from 75 to 497 days. Um, you know, age of slaughter um, averaged about 365 uh, with a range, um, or average, sorry, 500, um, let me get on the right, I need my old man glasses on. Average 513 days, the minimum was 364 and the max was 706, okay. Um, one of the really um, uh, interesting pieces was as we got into the data, um, and I'll show you a set of variance component estimates in a second was, um, a confounding between sire and contemporary group. Um, so some of the, the data that we got um, had, uh, or contemporary groups had uh, a, a very large representation of, of an individual sire. And so as you, you look through here, we've got, um, these are the two high use bulls um, combined um, in the, the data that went into our initial evaluation, um, about 14,000 progeny between the two bulls. Okay, and as you look through this, so Stetson and Alfredo are the two bulls, um, but they were used um, differentially across cow breed type. Um, so you can see in there, you know, Stetson on Holstein, straight Holstein cows um, had about twice as many progeny records as Alfredo did. Um, if you go down to the um, um, some older um, Holstein 
and they didn't know the backside of those pedigrees on those um, dairy cows. Um, Alfredo was used about tenfold different. Um, so there was some, some real sort of messiness in that data and it resulted in contemporary groups on occasion um, that you would have say Stetson with 80 or 90% of the calves in the contemporary group. So it makes it very difficult to disentangle sire effect from contemporary group effect. And so we had to do some work to kind of fix that uh, as we move through the analysis. One of the consequences of that and one of the big red flags was um, this was a sire model um, evaluation for heritability estimates for um, hot carcass weight, marbling, ribeye, and back fat. And you can see down there at the bottom, the weighted average or univariate um, heritability estimates, so a couple different, different approaches here, um, were about 0.25 to 0.3 for hot carcass weight, which is right in the ballpark of literature estimates. Um, the marbling ones are 0.7, which is on the very high end of um, uh, the literature estimates, ribeye area about 0.4, back fat about 0.5. And if you think about the diversity of genetics in here, um, we've got limousine, Angus, two different Jersey breeds that are pretty divergent. Um, you know, part of the additive differences are the breed differences. Um, and so we might expect these to have relatively high heritabilities. But in the middle of that table, you see the, the limousine on Jersey or limousine Jersey Holstein. Um, the heritability estimate was about 1.2. Okay. Is that concerning? Yes, right? All the animal breeders are going, what in the world? So this was a sire model, right? So we we're trying to estimate a quarter of the additive variance. Well, we dramatically overestimate it in this particular group. And if you go back through it, this is one of the groups that, um, if you'll remember from the previous slide, had a massive overrepresentation of one of the bulls. Um, and so that kind of confounding created some some bubbles in, um, in this analysis. So we took some approaches to try and fix that. Um, I went back and did um, an easy thing. Well, just take those two really high use bulls and drop them out of the data set, see what happens. Well, the heritability estimates for everything but marbling stayed pretty much the same. And marbling came back at least into the parameter space. Okay, so that was uh, reassuring. We did some additional work looking at uh, changing contemporary group from a fixed effect to a random uh, effect. And that seemed to help some. So we got down to about 0.7, um, which again is on the higher end of um, the literature estimates, but certainly given the genetic diversity of this group, um, we thought uh, fairly fairly reasonable. Okay, um, so if you go through and, and look at uh, um, you know literature estimates, they're included kind of in the middle of this table. Um, I did want to mostly point out in this slide, and it, it is a busy one, but in the bottom uh, matrix here. Um, the, uh, the heritabilities, the consensus heritabilities out of this analysis are there. So 0.29 for hot carcass weight, 0.7 for marbling, 0.4 for ribeye, and 0.5 for back fat. And then the other thing we are interested in is, well, the, are the genetic correlations or the relationships between traits when we've used these on arguably pretty different kinds of dairy cows, um, do they make sense? And they largely line up with what we expect in terms of um, genetic relationships. Um, in some cases, a little bit larger than what we see in the beef data. Um, but, you know, there's arguably not too many single data sets in the beef parameter estimate space that are as big as this. So uh, it's a little bit of the classic, well, the old evaluation's right, the new evaluation's wrong sort of approach, right? And you know, this is a, a pretty sizable data set, and we think we did a pretty good job um, getting the analysis right. Um, one of the things I mentioned earlier that we needed to do was estimate um, the breed differences for the dairy breeds in these carcass traits, which is um, we're actually planning to, to put this in a, in a peer reviewed publication because there's not a lot of, of contemporary or, or current data on uh, genetic differences for carcass traits um, out of the Holstein or the dairy populations. Um, and so we estimated, um, you know, the difference in hot carcass weight between um, Holstein and Jersey um, to be about 150 pounds difference in carcass weight. Okay. Um, the uh, difference in marbling, um, quite a bit narrower the, as we expect the Jersey cattle marble a little better. So this is in uh, degrees of marbling, just like the beef, uh, beef scale is. So about 19 or 20 points different. Um, ribeye area, um, Holstein quite a bit larger than, uh, than Jersey, of course. Um, and these are on an age constant basis, just like the, the IGS evaluation set up. Um, back fat, Holsteins are a little fatter, not much. That's, that's pretty the standard errors there get uh, uh, pretty close. So um, other fixed effects that we looked at, just to kind of see how they, they shook out. Um, 
uh, hot carcass weight gain, uh, age at slaughter, um, as an, so age at slaughter as an effect. So each additional day of age produced about 3.7 pounds of additional hot carcass weight. Um, these cattle actually gain pretty good live weight. So um, that seemed a little high, but uh, certainly in the space, um, super. Um, so uh, changes in the carcass evaluation, again, um, addition of about 50,000 um, carcass records, again, mostly out of um, purebred three quarter and half blood limousine bulls on uh, Holstein, Jersey, Hojo cross cows. Um, one of the things that's uh, imp been implemented here in the last couple of months, and, and I'll tip my hat again to Jim Bulger. He's, he bears much of the heavy lifting on the, the data processing side in this project now because we're streamlined or trying to streamline. I think we're pretty close to there, Jim, I think. Um, having a routine sort of process for automating data inbound from um, the wolf system on a monthly basis, we anticipate somewhere roughly between 7,500 and 10,000 records a month um, into that. We'll do periodic updates of the dairy pedigrees as we construct on those cows um, uh, to, to make sure we've got that current information out of the uh, dairy cattle evaluation. Um, we did a, a beta test uh, late in 2020 um, with IGS. So we ran, we had a, an evaluation one week and then the next week um, was the tick over of um, a, a beta run, same base data, just adding the additional um, beef on dairy um, as you went through that entire so we looked at the correlations of traits across all of the breed groups to make sure that there wasn't something that you know we pushed somebody way out of uh, out of space. Those correlations um, between uh, EPDs week over week were about 0.99. So um, lots of data, but not much disruption um, in that across the populations. Okay. Um, so what happened to bulls? So I think one of the, the really interesting things is to look at you know when you drop in arguably massive amounts of data. Um, how do EPDs and accuracies move uh, on individual bulls? And so here's um, uh, a listing of uh, some of the bulls that are in the evaluation. Um, these were sorted, um, I think on, yeah, it's on carcass progeny difference. So the second column um, from the, uh, the yeah, second column from the, the very right. Um, and so that's the count difference of progeny and contemporary groups as we added the beef on dairy data to the system. So we added about 14,000 progeny out of Stetson, about 8,200 progeny out of Mags Alfredo. Um, those two bulls were represented in 680 and 567 contemporary groups, which is just kind of amazing, right? I mean, if you think about um, a beef, say weaning weight or yearling weight evaluation, there'll be bulls that get hundreds of contemporary groups evaluated, um, but this is um, just a, a massive amount of, uh, of information. Um, as we look at um, um, changes then um, in EPD accuracy um, or carcass weight, um, or this is EP, sorry, change in accuracy for carcass weight. Um, Alfredo already had quite a bit of um, actual carcass data through um, Wolf's uh, beef on beef system, um, but uh, he went uh, up in accuracy about 37 points. So he's a 0.91 accuracy on carcass weight now. Uh, it was a 0.54. Um, sorry, that's Alfredo. Stetson was at 78, now is a 91. Um, as you go down that list, you'll see bulls that had, you know, substantially fewer progeny. And as you increase, um, you know, those, um, those progeny counts, um, because of the relatively high heritabilities, we see, you know, substantial changes in accuracy um, for these bulls. And I think that's really the um, principal outcome of the effort is, you know, again, leveraging that commercial data source um, to really drive um, the predictive capacity and genetic improvement system um, for these breeders. And they're, they're using the data, obviously. Um, so here's uh, some marbling um, differences, uh, the highlighted column in green here. Um, this one kind of focused on some of the, maybe the lower accuracy bulls um, that, that picked up substantial information into the system. Um, and, and, you know, one of the, the obvious things in here is, um, you know, just because they pass the fertility test doesn't mean that they potentially are great carcass bulls. Um, and so being able to weed through um, the data and find bulls that do a really good job in the dairy side on a consumption rate, but are higher value in terms of carcass merit are the bulls that they're after. Um, and so not surprising, there's some bulls in here that move favorably substantially in a number of traits. And there's some bulls that, um, 
probably aren't going to get used anymore, right? Because they have substantially lower carcass values. Okay. Um, so path forward. Um, I think this is the last slide between you and a, a frosty drink. Um, uh, dairy data included again uh, on a weekly basis in the IGS carcass run. Uh, pipeline, uh, I would say, completed between uh, Wolf to NALF to IGS uh, on this data, um, adding somewhere around um, uh, about 50,000 records so far um, with monthly updates of about 7,500. Um, that's all automated. Um, we are big fans, um, and, and Jim reinforces this with us all the time about the importance of automated data streams, right? So when we've got these coming in, um, the potential errors from human error um, can be uh, uh, pretty quick learning curves for what not to do when you mess it up, right? So um, I happen to be in my previous life, uh, a couple of times where breeds didn't send the same data week over week um, because of a data processing error, and uh, that makes lots of people not happy. So um, these automated data streams are, are really important to, to maintain that consistency and validity um, over time. Um, I think at the at the end of the day, uh, again, a really good example of uh, collaboration um, across um, entities. So, you know, somebody that's got a, a keen interest um, in both data collection and um, integration of breeding systems helped drive this. Um, but lots of partners that uh, that stepped up and, and helped make it happen. My charge to us is, as an industry, as seed stock cattle breeders, how might we exploit other data streams, right? So this is one that, you know, we have sort of an integrated captive audience that's that's trying to make use of it, that's willing to share that information into uh, largely the public domain. Um, but are there other opportunities for us out in the industry to capture, you know, information out of the beef on dairy system certainly is a, an obvious one, um, you know, health traits or fertility, things like that um, may become useful genetic predictors to the beef side with some validation. But Thinking in our beef value chain, um, how do we do a better job capturing the commercial data? You know, if we go look in the pig business, um, it's routine for them to evaluate seed stock in the commercial environment because of the occasional G by E interaction between the nucleus breeders and multipliers. That environment is enough different than commercial production to sort of re-rank boars, okay? Um, do you think that happens in cattle business? Do we provide a substantially different environment for seed stock bulls that we build versus what our commercial customers do for their calves or, or cows? Probably more interested in the cow side in that question. Okay. So I think there's opportunities for us to think broadly about data capture, um, and we should do that. And I think that fits really nicely with the discussion this morning. I thought this morning sessions were outstanding and really stretched um, my thinking about automated phenotype collection. Um, but beyond that, you know, how do we use the data we've got more effectively, right? So there's opportunities to look at, you know, novel traits um, within our existing data streams to augment these genetic evaluations. So um, with that, I'll stop. I'm glad to answer a few questions. Um, really appreciate everybody's attention. Dr. Odie. So I, I sort of skipped over that. I actually tested that. Um, and in the carcass traits, um, there, oh, sorry. Um, Dr. Odie asked about um, heterosis effects um, in, in carcass traits. And uh, um, I sort of glossed over that bit. There was a, a slide in there, I actually tested that. So I modeled um, heterozygosity um, from those various breed fact fractions um, and tested that and they all came out not different than zero, which for is not atypical for carcass traits. So, but yep, great question. I tested that though. So, yep, Carrie. Yeah, good question. So that uh, requirement for Carrie's question is, did the removal of the weaning weight um, uh, parameter requirement in the IGS evaluation reintroduce selection bias? Um, and that's a, a really good question. Um, you know, if we think back to the, the carcass 
parameters and the structure of the IGS evaluation. It's a legacy of, you know, the old Simmental multi-breed evaluation. Um, and that evaluation had that, that requirement and fit weaning weight as a, uh, additional covariate or correlated trait to do that um, culling bias accounting. Um, and that was driven out of, you know, data largely collected in the 70s and 80s on, you know, they were basically the cull bulls out of purebred breeding programs. And if you look at the, the current data across most of the breed associations is not that data. Um, it's actually either structured carcass test data um, or unstructured data that, you know, producers have gone out and, you know, sold bulls to somebody, they parent verify them, feed that information into the system. So there's, there's markedly less selection bias in the current data than there was in the old data. Um, and the other bit was, you know, these are, all without weaning weight. There's no selection for growth traits per se in the dairy side. Um, and so dropping it, um, that was one of the reasons we did the beta test, right? Was to, to look at, you know, an evaluation one week that had the requirement for the beef on beef data, the traditional data in there under the regular parameters, and then removing those to relax them to include the beef on dairy data. And the rank correlations were nearly one. So yeah, yeah, good, good question. Which was a little surprising, you know. That that was one of the things we were really worried about was, you know, you make these what we thought were substantial changes to the evaluation structure, but you know, you take and the amount of data we poured in probably represented a quarter of the data in the analysis now in just one turn. Um, if it was going to disrupt it, it had plenty of chance to do it. So, yeah, good, Don. Yeah, there weren't. So I had to, the effects I estimated were all out of the contrasts of the dam types by, you know, accounting for the sire mating. So, um, yeah, there weren't any in this data. Everything was either limousine or limflex sired predominantly. There was a few straight Angus calf or Angus sired calves in the stream, um, but none of them that we captured were Holstein on Holstein or Holstein on Jersey. Yeah, yeah good question. That would have been ideal. Um, Yes, sir. Yeah, great question. We we talked a little bit about that, um, and we haven't done that part yet. Um, so, sorry, the, the question was, um, um, did we do any forward prediction work? So one of the strategies we've done a lot in the genomics work is mask the most current calf crop um, and then use the genetic evaluation predictions. Um, so the EPDs of bulls to predict contemporary group progeny differences um, to see how good or reliable those predictors are. Um, so try and predict progeny performance based on sire genetic merit. Um, and that's a, a, a fairly routine practice now in, in sort of validating single step genomic models. Uh, we did not take that step yet, um, but one we've talked about and as we get a, a little more data flow, being able to truncate off that most recent group. And yep, yeah, great question. Yes, Larry. Yes. Um, no, they went back actually in the, in the, I'm, I'm pretty sure I don't see Chip may know the answer to this. I'm 99% I'm confident the IGS current carcass evaluation is a fixed effect for contemporary group. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I thought, you know, in this particular case, when you have really sort of messy, unstructured data, um, being able to sort of gauge the variance of those groups, um, useful, you know, I got my the parameter estimates back in space. So that was, I thought, a good, compelling sign that they made some sense. So yeah, good question. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
yeah, you're talking implementation at the commercial scale. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so they've one of the, the benefits of being big is you get to negotiate directly with the packer. And so they've got a grid and an agreement built with the packer to take these cattle. Yep. Oh, I got you. Yep. Um, I don't know. Mark probably has got a better idea on the, the, the stream. I suspect some of them qualify for CAB based on grade. Um, there's a really low percentage of these calves actually get the dairy type discount. It's less than half a percent. So you go from a product that, you know, you run a straight set of Holstein steers in, just, you know, hold on to your wallet, right? Um, but when you can move these to less than half a percent discount uh, by head basis um, from, for the dairy discount, that's a massive change in carcass value just on the, the pricing structure, right? So not counting, you know, the additional weight and grade and performance and yield of those cattle through, um, through the system. So, but they get, they go into a major packer and then I'm sure split across uh, a variety. So they're grid priced in, but on the outbound side, they qualify just right in with the beef stream product. So they get sorted into probably two or three different um, house brand lines um, and then some specific branded product lines. So Mark, I don't know if you want to add, yeah, the, the consistency of the product's pretty amazing too. As you look at, um, you know, they, they manage them aggressively, like lots of cattle and feed yards. So they got three slaughter endpoints. Um, they monitored clear through. In fact, we had a, a couple of discussions yesterday about how do we include the growth and weight rate data, um, out of this data stream, cause they get weighed, um, four or five times through this process. So at re, re implant arrival at the feed yard, so forth, how do we capture that growth data, um, into the system? Cause it's useful. Um, yeah, good questions. Anybody else going once who wants a cold drink? <laughs> well, on, uh, um, I think behalf of well, Matt left. And so he asked me to make the, uh, the closing gratitude. So, um, he had to go give a talk, um, talk about over, over committed Matt, I think he has four talks here this week. So that tells you the, the kind of guy he is. Um, but, uh, Matt asked me to kind of wrap up and, and just say thanks for everybody for coming to BIF and coming to uh, the selection decisions committee. Um, we appreciate you being here. And, uh, um, I will, one thing I left out of the lunch, so this is going to be a subset. Um, you'll get a online, uh, request or an email request for an online survey of, of the conference. Um, please take a few minutes and, and complete that. Um, good feedback for, um, both the BIF um, organization and, and the board of directors as we plan future events, but also good feedback for the Iowa State folks. So we'll appreciate that. Um, and there'll be a question in there about topics to include in next year's program. So we find that one particularly useful. So spend a little time and, and suggest some topics for us. That'd be great. Thank you.